This is a real story, and I feel everything. You won't believe what happened, but it's the truth. It's been over a year now, and I still can't shake it. It haunts me, every night, every waking moment. It all started in that quiet, small town in New Hampshire. A place you wouldn't think much about unless you lived there. I used to love the stillness, the way the town seemed forgotten by the rest of the world. But now I know why it's so isolated, why people rarely talk about it. The disappearances had been happening for generations, but no one ever really discussed them openly. There were whispers, of course, and the old folks had their tales, but most people chalked it up to wild animals, accidents, or people just wanting to leave their lives behind. Every 50 years, though, like clockwork, people would vanish. They were never found. No bodies, no traces, nothing. And the strangest part, it always started with a few people going missing and then. Silence, as if it never happened. The cycle would begin, and then, once enough people were gone, it would end as mysteriously as it started. When I moved to the town, it was quiet. Nothing seemed out of place. People were friendly enough, but there was something odd about the way they looked at me, like they were trying to hide something. The town seemed frozen in time, like it was stuck in another era. Even the air felt thick with something old, something ancient. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I should have known. I should have listened to my gut. I'd heard about the curse. Everyone had. A witch, they said, was executed by the original settlers for practicing dark magic. She cursed the town as she was dying, swearing she would return to take her revenge on the people who wronged her. It was all part of the local folklore, nothing more than ghost stories to most people. But then, the disappearances started again. I first noticed it when old man Davis went missing. No one seemed too concerned he was in his late 70s and lived alone. People said he probably wandered off into the woods and got lost. But then Mary, who lived two houses down from me, disappeared too. She was younger, in her 40s, and had kids. They found her car still parked in her driveway, the front door wide open. She had been home. I started asking questions, talking to people around town, trying to make sense of it. But everyone acted like it was normal, like this was just something that happened. That's what scared me the most how no one seemed surprised. They all had this resigned look in their eyes, like they knew something terrible was coming, but they didn't want to admit it. It was like they were expecting it, waiting for it. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story. So I did what I thought anyone in my position would do, I started digging. I spent hours in the library, going through old records, looking for any clues. That's when I found them the journals. They were hidden in the back of the archives, tucked away in a dusty box that hadn't been touched in years. They belonged to one of the original settlers, a man named Samuel Parker. His entries started out like any other documenting life in the new colony, the hardships they faced, the building of the town. But then, about halfway through, the tone changed. He started writing about strange occurrences, lights in the woods, people going missing, and then coming back, different. He mentioned a woman, Eleanor, who lived on the outskirts of the settlement. She was accused of practicing witchcraft, of summoning dark spirits. The final entry was the most disturbing. It was dated the day before Eleanor's execution. Parker wrote that Eleanor had cursed the town, that she swore she would return every 50 years to take the souls of those she deemed responsible. She said the town would never be free, that the people would suffer for eternity, their bloodline forever tainted by the curse. I should have stopped reading. I should have left it alone. But it was too late. The more I read, the more I realized the curse was real. The disappearances weren't random, they were part of something bigger, something darker. And it wasn't over. I wasn't the only one who noticed the pattern. A few others in town locals mostly had been quietly investigating it too. We started meeting in secret, sharing our findings, trying to figure out how to stop whatever was happening. But the more we uncovered, the more dangerous it became. People were disappearing faster now. Not just one or two here and there, but entire families. It was around this time that we started seeing things. Ghostly figures in the woods, shadowy apparitions that would appear out of nowhere. I'd catch glimpses of them from the corner of my eye, just standing there, watching. But when I turned to look directly, they'd be gone. And the whispers. They were the worst. Late at night I could hear them, 
Faint at first, like the wind through the trees, but soon they became louder, more distinct. They were saying my name. We tried everything burning sage, hanging crosses, praying, but nothing worked. The disappearances continued. The figures grew closer, more menacing. I stopped going outside at night altogether, and during the day, I kept to the main roads. But it didn't matter. They could still find me. One night, I woke up to the sound of scratching at my window. It was soft at first, like a branch brushing against the glass, but it grew louder, more insistent. I got up, slowly, and looked out. There was nothing there, but the woods behind my house felt alive, like something was moving through the trees, watching. The next morning, there were muddy footprints leading up to my door, but no one had been there. No one human, at least. The journal had warned of this, it described how the witch would come for you first in whispers and shadows before finally taking you. That's how it started with the others, and now it was starting with me. The last meeting we had was a disaster. Only three of us showed up. Two others had vanished the night before, and no one could explain it. We were running out of time. We needed answers, but the town was falling apart. People were too scared to talk, too scared to leave their homes. It felt like the curse had taken hold of everything. I couldn't sleep anymore. Every time I closed my eyes, I'd see her. The witch. She wasn't just a shadow now, she had form. A face, twisted and pale, with hollow eyes that seemed to bore into my soul. She was always there, just outside the window, just beyond the trees. Waiting. And then came the night I saw her up close. It was late, past midnight, and I was sitting by the fireplace trying to keep warm. The wind howled outside, rattling the windows, but that didn't bother me anymore. I'd gotten used to it. But then, in the middle of the gusts, I heard something else. A soft voice. A woman's voice. It wasn't coming from outside. It was inside, right behind me. I turned around, and she was there. Standing in the doorway, her face gaunt and decayed, her eyes empty and lifeless. I couldn't move, couldn't scream. She raised a hand, pointing at me, and I felt it a cold grip around my heart. The room seemed to close in around me, the air thick with something ancient, something evil. I don't know how long I was frozen there, staring into her dead eyes, but when I finally blinked, she was gone. Just like that. But the curse wasn't. I could feel it. It had taken hold of me, marked me as its next victim. I tried to leave the town, pack up and get out before it was too late, but the roads were blocked, washed out by a storm that had come out of nowhere. The locals said it was the witch, that she controlled the weather, that she wouldn't let me go. And they were right. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't escape. People kept disappearing. The town was emptying out, one by one, until it was just a handful of us left. We knew it was only a matter of time. The journal had said the cycle would end when enough souls were taken, and I could feel it. The witch was almost done. Now I'm the only one left. The others are gone. I don't know where they went, or what happened to them, but I'm sure they're dead. Or worse. I'm sitting here writing this, knowing that my time is almost up. The whispers are louder now. The shadows are moving closer. I can hear them outside, calling my name. She's coming for me next. It was 2019 when I moved to Ashgrove, a small, forgotten town nestled in the forests of New Hampshire. I had taken a job as a freelance journalist, looking for a quiet place to work and write. Ashgrove seemed perfect cheap rent, a peaceful atmosphere, and not much happening. At least, that's what I thought. I hadn't heard the stories, not at first. I wasn't aware of the town's dark past or the legend that had kept outsiders away for decades. The locals weren't eager to share it either, not until the first night I heard the bell. The town was small, barely more than a few streets lined with old colonial houses in a single, run-down main road that hadn't been repaved in years. The forests crept in from every side, thick with evergreens that blocked out most of the sunlight, even on the brightest days. At the center of the town stood the remains of the old church burnt, blackened stone walls and the skeletal frame of a bell tower that jutted into the sky like a broken tooth. 
It didn't take long for someone to mention the church. I was grabbing groceries from the tiny convenience store when an older woman at the counter noticed the notebook sticking out of my bag. She asked if I was a writer, and when I said yes, her expression darkened. She gave me a knowing look, then nodded toward the church in the distance. Careful with that place, she said. Strange things happen around here. I smiled politely, assuming she was just one of those superstitious old-timers every town seems to have. I didn't think much of it. That night I was lying in bed, the small clock on my nightstand glowing dimly in the darkness. Midnight. The town was eerily quiet, as it had been every night since I'd arrived, the kind of stillness that makes you question if you're the only one left in the world. I had just started to drift off when I heard it the bell. It was faint at first, barely noticeable through the thick walls of my rented house, but it grew louder with each toll, a deep, resonant clang that sent a shiver through my chest. It rang out steadily, twelve times, each chime reverberating through the night. I sat up in bed, listening. There was something off about the sound, something unnatural. It wasn't like the clear, ringing tone of a church bell. It was distorted, warped, like it was coming from deep underground. I didn't sleep much that night, but I convinced myself it was nothing a trick of the wind, maybe, or some old mechanism still buried in the ruins of the church. The next morning I casually mentioned the bell to the guy working at the hardware store. His reaction surprised me, his face went pale, and he quickly changed the subject. That's when I realized there was more to it. I started asking around, trying to find out why no one wanted to talk about the church. Most people brushed me off, offering vague warnings or pretending they hadn't heard me, but eventually I got the story. In the late 1800s, the church had been the center of the town, its bell tower ringing out every Sunday to call the congregation to service. The minister, Father Elias, had been well-liked, known for his fiery sermons and devotion to the community. But something had changed in him over the years. People said he became obsessed with sin, with the idea that the town was cursed. He started preaching about fire and brimstone, warning that judgment was coming, and that only the pure would be spared. Then, one night, the church burned. No one knew how it started, but the fire consumed the building in minutes, trapping the congregation inside. The town watched helplessly as the flames devoured the church, the bell ringing wildly as the fire reached the tower. Witnesses said they could hear screams, could see the figures of people pounding on the windows, but no one could save them. By morning, the church was nothing but ash and rubble, and the bell, which had rung its last desperate chime, had melted in the fire. The town buried the victims in a mass grave, and the bell tower was never rebuilt. But that's when the legend started. People claimed to hear the bell ringing at midnight, long after it had been destroyed. And worse, those who heard it said they were haunted by visions burning figures, shadowy faces staring at them from the dark. The few who admitted to hearing it often disappeared shortly after, or died under mysterious circumstances. The town whispered that the spirits of the congregation were still trapped, still burning, and the bell was their cry for vengeance. I didn't believe any of it. I was a journalist, a skeptic by nature. Haunted bells and cursed towns didn't fit into my worldview. But the more I asked, the more uncomfortable people became. Some flat out refused to speak to me. I could feel the unease spreading, could sense that I was digging into something they didn't want uncovered. Then the vision started. It was a week after I heard the bell for the first time. I was sitting at my desk, reviewing my notes when I caught movement out of the corner of my eye. I looked up, expecting to see someone outside, but the street was empty. I shrugged it off, went back to my work, but the feeling lingered that sense that I was being watched. That night, the bell rang again. Twelve deep, distorted clangs that echoed through the silence of the town. But this time, it didn't stop after twelve. It kept ringing, over and over, each chime more frantic, more desperate. I lay in bed, frozen, my heart pounding in my chest. Then the temperature in the room dropped, and I could see my breath fogging in the air. That's when I saw them. Figures. Dark. Indistinct shapes moving outside my window, their outlines flickering like flames. They were human, but distorted, their limbs too long, their bodies twisted. I blinked, 
rubbed my eyes, but they didn't go away. They drifted closer, their faces shrouded in shadow, and as they neared, I could hear whispers low, raspy voices like wind through dry leaves. I didn't sleep that night. The figures eventually disappeared, but the cold remained, clinging to the house like a thick fog. The bell rang again the next night, and the visions returned this time closer, clearer. I could see their faces now, or what was left of them. Burned, charred skin, mouths open in silent screams, their eyes empty and hollow. They reached for me, their hands blackened and claw-like, and I felt a crushing weight in my chest, like something was pressing down on me, suffocating me. I knew then that the stories were real. The bell, the spirits, the fire, it wasn't just a legend. It was happening, and I was caught in the middle of it. I tried to leave town the next morning, packed my bags, and drove toward the highway. But as I reached the edge of town, my car sputtered and died. I tried everything, checked the engine, tried calling for help, but my phone wouldn't work. It was as if the town itself wouldn't let me go. When I walked back into town, I noticed the looks on people's faces. They knew. They had seen it before. No one said a word, but I could see it in their eyes, the pity, the fear. They knew I was marked. That night, the bell rang louder than ever, its tone deep and angry, vibrating through the air like thunder. The shadows were waiting for me when I got home, crowding around the edges of my vision, whispering, calling to me. I couldn't stay in that house anymore. I grabbed my things and ran, my footsteps echoing down the empty streets, the cold biting at my skin. I ended up back at the church ruins. The bell tower loomed above me, its blackened stone gleaming in the moonlight. And that's when I heard the voices clearly, rising from the ground beneath my feet. They were still burning. I ran. I don't remember much after that, just flashes running through the woods, the sound of branches snapping underfoot, the bell ringing in my ears. I don't know how I made it out, but I did. I'm not in Ashgrove anymore. I left as soon as my car started working again, never looking back. But the bell still rings in my dreams, and sometimes when I close my eyes, I see them the burning figures, their hollow eyes staring back at me, waiting. I know they'll find me again. It's only a matter of time. It was the summer of 2017 when everything changed in our quiet town in New Hampshire. Nothing ever really happened there. The same faces, the same routine. It was the kind of place where everyone knew each other and nothing was ever out of the ordinary. Or at least, that's how it seemed. But looking back, the signs had been there all along strange accidents, random deaths, always happening around the same few blocks. We just didn't connect the dots until it was too late. I remember hearing about the latest tragedy that year. A boy from school, Greg Henson, had drowned in the creek. Except everyone who knew him swore he was a strong swimmer. The police ruled it an accident, but there was something about it that didn't sit right with me, or with my friends Ben, Travis, and Sarah. It wasn't just Greg. There had been a string of deaths in town over the last few years' freak accidents, unexplained incidents, and they all seemed to happen in the same small area. It was too much of a coincidence. Sarah was the one who first brought up the cemetery. She said her grandfather had told her about it when she was younger, a forgotten burial ground deep in the woods just outside town. According to him, the town's earliest settlers were buried their unmarked graves, hidden away. They weren't exactly heroes, either. There were stories about how they had wronged the native tribes, taking land that didn't belong to them. The tribes had supposedly cursed them before their deaths, and they were buried without ceremony, hoping to hide the shame. Of course, none of us really believed it at first. It was just a story. But after Greg's death, and all the others, we started to wonder. What if there was something to it? What if those deaths weren't accidents? We became obsessed with the idea that the cemetery was real, and somehow connected to everything happening in town. We had to know for sure. One night in August, we made the decision to go. It was stupid, but we were kids bored, restless and curious. We planned everything, waited until our parents were asleep, and snuck out after midnight. The air was warm, and the woods surrounding town were thick with humidity, the kind that makes it hard to breathe. 
We grabbed flashlights and headed toward the edge of town, where the trees grew dense and twisted, a place where few people ventured. It wasn't long before we were completely surrounded by the forest. The path we followed was barely visible, overgrown and choked by brush. The deeper we went, the quieter it got, like the woods were holding their breath. The only sound was the crunch of dead leaves beneath our feet and the occasional snap of a branch as we pushed through. About an hour in, we found it. The cemetery wasn't like the ones you see in town, no neatly arranged headstones or gates. It was nothing more than a clearing, overgrown with weeds and tangled vines, barely distinguishable from the rest of the forest. At first glance, it looked like we'd found nothing at all. But then Travis kicked something hard with his foot, and we realized it was a stone marker, half buried in the dirt. As we cleared away the debris, we found more of them old, cracked stones, no names, no dates. Just jagged, unmarked slabs of rock, lying in the earth like forgotten relics. Sarah was the first to speak, her voice trembling as she said she felt something, something cold. The air had changed. It wasn't just the temperature. There was a heaviness around us, an unnatural chill that seemed to come from the ground itself, like the earth beneath our feet was. Alive somehow. We should have left right then and there, but we didn't. Ben knelt down and started brushing dirt off one of the stones, his flashlight flickering in the dim light. That's when the ground shifted. I don't know how else to describe it. It wasn't like the earth just moved, it was like it breathed. The dirt rippled beneath us, and an overwhelming cold enveloped the clearing, so intense that I could feel it in my bones. I remember looking at the others, seeing the fear in their eyes, the same fear that was twisting my stomach into knots. And then the first voice came. It was faint, almost like a whisper carried on the wind, but it was there. A low, mournful sound, coming from everywhere and nowhere all at once. We froze, every muscle tensing as we listened, straining to make out the words. I couldn't. It wasn't in English, but it was unmistakably human, painful, desperate. And then it grew louder. More voices joined in, overlapping, rising in intensity, until they filled the air around us, pressing in on all sides. It felt like they were closing in, surrounding us, like the very trees were alive with the sound. We turned to leave, but it was too late. The ground heaved again, this time harder, and I felt something brush against my ankle. I looked down and saw what looked like a hand, pale and skeletal, reaching up from the dirt. The sight of it sent a shock of terror through me. I stumbled back, my heart racing, and that's when I realized it wasn't just one hand. There were more of them, pushing up through the earth, clawing their way out of the graves. We ran. I don't remember much about how we got out of those woods. It was a blur of panic, the four of us crashing through the trees, our flashlights bouncing wildly in the darkness. The voices didn't stop. They followed us, growing louder, angrier. I could feel something chasing us, something cold and ancient, something that wanted to drag us back to that cursed ground. We made it back to the edge of town, just as the first light of dawn started to creep over the horizon. We didn't stop until we reached Sarah's house, collapsing on the front porch, gasping for air, covered in dirt and scratches. We sat there in silence for what felt like hours, too afraid to speak, too afraid to acknowledge what had just happened. The next day, we went our separate ways. None of us talked about it after that night, but the curse, if that's what it was, hadn't been lifted. It had followed us. Travis was the first to fall sick. He said he couldn't sleep, that the voices wouldn't stop. They'd follow him into his dreams, whispering, calling him back to the cemetery. He grew weaker by the day, pale and gaunt, like the life was being drained from him. He stopped coming to school, and the last time I saw him, he looked like a ghost hollow-eyed, barely recognizable. Then it was Sarah. She disappeared one night. Her parents said she'd run away, but I knew better. I knew she'd gone back to the cemetery, just like the voices wanted. By the end of the year, there were only two of us left, Ben and me. We tried to act like it hadn't happened, like it was some terrible dream, but we both knew the truth. We'd disturbed something that night, something that should have been left alone. And now, it was taking us one by one. Ben's death was ruled an accident. They said he fell from the roof of his house, but I know he didn't jump. I know the truth. 
I'm the only one left now, and I can feel it closing in. The cold has returned, stronger than ever, and the voices have started again, louder each night. I can hear them even now, as I write this whispers just outside my window, calling my name. I know what's coming. I can't escape it. It's only a matter of time before they come for me, too. <laughs>